on a mile final, cross roads turbulence, wind 1504. American 694, we're passing 10 5 or 6. 3420, turn off heading 100. 100, there you go, 5 30, 20. Scammers 26 second, Las Vegas, turn off wind 020, one right, quick left. One right, clear left, guys, 26 seconds. Scammers 26 Every year, Nearly 1.4 billion people pass through airport checkpoints worldwide. What they must put up with before boarding an aircraft is influenced, if not dictated, by one agency of the U.S. government. Most passengers don't even know its name, but they're certainly familiar with its demeaning methods. It is an agency that has effectively avoided public scrutiny, frustrated congressional oversight, and silenced most of its internal critics as it continues to expand, spend, and fail. But throughout its short, controversial history, a few insiders have been working to expose those failures. Their stories reveal an expensive, ineffective, unchecked bureaucracy, the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA. The story begins with the Transportation Security Administration's predecessor agency, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration. It was the FAA which was responsible for airport security on September 11, 2001, when hijackers killed nearly 3,000 people and brought the world's largest aviation system to a standstill. Shocked by the attacks and goaded relentlessly by the media, the U.S. government felt compelled to do something to prevent any future strike from ever happening again. The federal government reacted to 9-11 by creating the Homeland Security Department. They took 17 agencies and they combined them and therefore created the largest bureaucracy in Washington. It included TSA, which created our airport screeners. In early 2002, the Transportation Security Administration assumed responsibilities previously entrusted to FAA. Some frontline agents argued that the new system was actually inferior to the one it replaced. Aviation security under FAA was virtually non-existent. Anybody could virtually do anything they wanted to any time they wanted to. But the TSA has taken things a step further. It's a disaster waiting to happen. We went from an agency that was supposed to conduct actual screening for people that wanted to hurt us to where now we're failing operational tests left and right. The TSA is reacting today and spending millions today on something that the terrorists did yesterday. Before 9-11, airport checkpoints had been operated by the airlines and simply monitored by the FAA, which worked closely with the airlines to move passengers onto planes as quickly as possible. Security was never a priority, despite mounting evidence that terrorists would try to exploit vulnerabilities in the aviation system. Evidence which was apparent in the 1980s. In 1985, TWA Flight 847 from Athens was hijacked and taken to Beirut. A 17-day ordeal ensued in which one passenger, Robert Steatham, a U.S. Navy diver, was tortured, killed, and his body dumped onto the tarmac. The incident prompted a reassessment of the U.S. Federal Air Marshal Service. In 1988, Bogdan Jakovich was recruited into the Air Marshals and promoted to team leader in 1993. It was exactly where I wanted to be. I considered it a vocation, actually, because our, our main focus was purely to prevent acts of terrorism in the aviation environment. When I went overseas as an air marshal, we would frequently have liaison with like the local law enforcement people of the country that we were in. 
as well as the federal authorities, and we would exchange ideas and, and you know, just talk. I soon found that there was so much information on terrorism from purely open sources that I couldn't, I couldn't keep it all. I had a stack of documents. So after a couple of years, I started my own terrorism database. And I actually briefed the team on open source information on terrorism, which was better than the classified briefing that we had. And because there's a mentality in the elements of the intelligence community that the more I know, the less you know, and that makes me, you know, a little more important. So we, they don't tell you what you need to know. So they keep a lot of it to themselves. The importance of government agencies sharing information became painfully obvious on December 21st, 1988, when a bomb hidden in a piece of luggage destroyed Pan Am Flight 103. All 256 people on board were killed, as were 11 others on the ground in Lockerbie, Scotland. An inquiry into the disaster in 1990 exposed a number of failures that were never addressed prior to 9-11 and continue to plague aviation security today. There was an incident just days before Pan Am 103 was bombed. A caller to the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki warned the embassy that within two weeks a U.S. airliner would be targeted for destruction. The embassy took that information, circulated it among the embassy personnel of, of U.S. facilities worldwide. They didn't notify airlines. They didn't notify the FBI. They didn't notify the CIA. They just circulated so that, as we learned in the course of our uh, investigation, that some State Department personnel chose not to fly the uh, U.S. carriers, the weekend of Pan Am 103. We were appalled by this. We said that as we inquired further, it turns out that there was sort of a bureaucratic uh, maze involved. An assistant secretary of state would not deign to call an administrator of FAA, or for heaven's sakes, an associate administrator of FAA, because that's beneath that person's level of standing within the government agency. Several years after Pan Am 103 was destroyed over Lockerbie, Jakovic met Steve Elson, an FAA security special agent. We began to talk quite a bit, and we found we had many similar experiences. We were both somewhat frightened by what we saw in the FA regarding vulnerabilities. We both had backgrounds in terrorism, academically and operationally. And the more we talked, the more we became determined to try to work and remedy some of those problems. Elson had joined the FAA after a distinguished 22-year career as a Navy SEAL. He served in Vietnam, worked numerous counterterrorism operations, earned a master's degree in national security affairs, and eventually retired as a lieutenant commander. In the FAA, he served as a member of the Red Team and was later joined by Djokovic, who was assigned to the unit in the mid-90s. Red Team is a military term for personnel who test the defenses of friendly forces using enemy tactics. Red teams are employed by government agencies to provide essential data on the effectiveness of security measures. In the red team, we went out and did realistic testing. And we used innocuous items that should have caused people to inspect us more closely. On a number of occasions, we used real items, guns, grenades, or bombs. And uh, the results were pretty much the same. Once you got out of the standard FAA testing realm, which the screeners were conditioned to, failure rates generally remained above 90%. That's failure rates. 
In the 1997-1998 timeframe, the FAA Red Team was tasked with doing a lot of screening checkpoint testing domestically. And we probably went to about 20 to 25 major airports around the country. And the results were fairly abominable. They range at a low of about a 3% success rate of the screeners detecting our objects at one airport, up to about 20% at the best airports. Standard testing had a 22, 32, or 38 caliber semi-automatic pistol in a block of lucite plastic. You could see through it. And the barrel had to be pointed down, which made no difference since it was in a big block of plastic. And if we had somehow screwed up, put the block of plastic in with the barrel up, that negated the test. And I had a case when the screener went back, they touched me and I turned a little bit. They completely missed the weapon. Of course, the airlines claimed that I cheated, and the FAA said, that's right, he shouldn't have moved, and they threw the test out. Terrorists aren't like that. <laughs> They're sneaky. FAA managers worked closely with the airlines to streamline operations, at times introducing absurdly unrealistic testing procedures. I'm in Houston. I am told I am to go out, stand in front of an aircraft, in a coat and tie, in 100 and something degree weather, just basically stand in front of the aircraft. I had to stand there five minutes and make sure that any people working around the airport actually looked at me to see I didn't have a badge. So I was started writing headquarters. I said, no, I'm confused out here in the field. Do we have some memorandum of understanding or memorandum of agreement with the terrorists that we and they will always agree on the way things are to be done. And then when they go out to blow up a plane, they will wear a suit and tie, stand five minutes in front of a plane, and make sure somebody sees them before they're allowed to put a bomb on the plane. I didn't get very many kind responses from the FAA. Usually the worse the results were we, that we had in any, any given type of project, the less we were tasked to retest to see if they improved. And the screening checkpoint was, uh, testing regimen that we did was one of those programs where the testing we did was so bad as far as the success rate that the screeners had that they just terminated the testing. Other testing had similarly poor results. In 1996, the Red Team was tasked with assessing the CTX machine, a device used to find explosives in luggage. It was one of the first in a long line of costly technological solutions aggressively promoted by a burgeoning multi-billion dollar security industrial complex, solutions that have consistently failed to perform as advertised. The red team was tasked with doing intensive testing of the CTX machine. And literally for 12 months, I spent 10 days out of each month in San Francisco doing testing of the CTX machine. We would actually use a higher amount of explosives than that the machine was designed to detect to make sure that it did detect the explosives that we were using even though terrorists would probably use a smaller amount. So when we did the testing, we were basically trying to get caught. We were doing testing that the machine was specifically designed to detect on. But even with that approach, the CTX machine would miss two thirds to three quarters of the devices that we sent through the machine. The issue goes back to what was the legal or allowed testing protocols. In the field, the FAA could only test on specific items carried in a certain way. Anything outside of that wasn't fair. The DOT or head of FAA said we have to comport with the fairness to the airlines. Terrorists do not comport to those fairness standards. Adriana 201 Heavy, wind 250 Niner, clear for takeoff.
there were two concerns of mine as the late 90s were passing by and 2000 was approaching. One is that as a red team leader, we fully documented repeatedly that security was a joke almost everywhere we went. The second thing was I also knew that the terrorist threat was increasing dramatically, that there literally was a paradigm shift. Two events were particularly ominous. They indicated the introduction of suicide tactics into the realm of aviation and were designed to kill people by the thousands. On Christmas Eve of 1994, Air France Flight 8969 from Algeria was hijacked at the gate and flown to Marseille. While it was on the ground, French commandos stormed the plane, freed all 171 hostages aboard, and killed the four hijackers. The assailants, members of the armed Islamic group, had planned to have the plane refueled, depart, and crash it into or explode it over the center of Paris. French authorities traveled to Washington, D.C. and briefed FAA officials in early 1995. Two weeks after the Air France incident, police in the Philippines discovered an extraordinary Al-Qaeda plot known as Bojinka, a term used by jihadists in Afghanistan in the 80s meaning Big Bang. One part of the plan involved simultaneous mid-air detonations of U.S.-bound airliners over the Pacific Ocean. Another portion involved flying a plane into CIA headquarters, or the Pentagon, a goal actually achieved seven years later. So those two situations right there should have been a massive wake-up call, but having been still with FAA security at the time, it, it, they could care less about it. Management would end any discussion about improving security by stating, it was words to the effect, and, and I've heard this I don't know how many times during that time frame, that we must be doing something right because we have not had a terrorist attack since Panama 103. Management simply did not tolerate any kind of dissenting opinion or even a discussion about maybe we should do things better. They had a dictatorial approach to how they did things and if you didn't like it, then get, get the hell out, it was their approach. Frustrated with FAA management's indifference to the mounting threat and their unwillingness to adopt proven European and Israeli security measures, Djokovic approached the Department of Transportation's Office of the Inspector General. He documented scores of incidents that highlighted security lapses he had witnessed at airports throughout the United States. I had a number of meetings with the head of, uh, of the Criminal Investigations Office, and in one meeting, he, he took a piece of paper like this that I had just given him, and he threw it up in the air like this, and he said, FAA is so fucked up, I don't even know where to begin. And then at a subsequent meeting, he said, um, Unless you give me a dead body and a smoking gun, there's nothing we can do against the FAA, the managers in FAA, because of the political situation between the Department of Transportation and the FAA. And well, 9-11 of course happened and we had nearly 3,000 dead bodies and a smoking cannon and the IG still didn't do anything. Examining the intelligence indicators which preceded the 9-11 attacks was kind of like watching a bathtub fill with water. It was just a matter of time before the bathtub would overflow or the attack would occur. There was so much information that it was inevitable that something was going to happen. And the problem we had was trying to get someone in authority in either FAA or Congress to turn the faucet off. And when 9-11 occurred, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, we simply had no idea anything like this was going to happen. We didn't know security was this bad. They acted like this was a great big surprise and they, they were totally caught off guard when in fact they had tons of information that not only was a threat increasing, but that security was essentially a joke. The 9-11 attacks were a sobering wake-up call to America and the world. Politicians and bureaucrats 
who had been indifferent to the growing threat, scrambled to redesign the security apparatus. About two weeks after 9-11, uh, I was invited to go to Capitol Hill from both the House and the Senate committee that we dealt with before 9-11. And when we walked in there, the staff members, these are the senior staff members, one of the first things they said was, you were right, uh, both about the vulnerabilities in security and the, the terrorist attack, but our concern now is where do we go from here? So we spent w well over an hour, an hour and a half, um, discussing some of the things they should do. And our big warning was not to establish another um, super agency like the TSA. One of the issues that I have personally is I helped create uh, TSA. And I've referred to it sometimes as either my bastard child or a monster that we've uh, created, a bureaucratic monster. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when we um, raise a family or have children, sometimes they turn out the way you uh, don't uh, expect. Uh, that's the same way with government programs. Uh, our intent after 9-11 was put together a system, uh, aviation security system, that would protect Americans against uh, future terrorist attacks. And it didn't turn out exactly the way I intended. When TSA was first created, they essentially spent the, the first three years of their existence meeting congressional mandates that were very difficult to meet. They had to stand up an agency, hire over 50,000 screeners, deploy technology that manufacturers couldn't uh, develop quickly enough. And so they didn't have a whole lot of time to think, do kind of the systematic planning and put, put the rigor in their processes that maybe GAO would have liked to have seen. The new agency spent its first year staffing up with the same FAA managers who had been responsible for security prior to 9-11. Once in place, these managers immediately set their sights on growing their empire and punishing anyone who spoke out. In early 2002, Djokovic was stripped of his red team duties. After uh, roughly 25 to 26 years of dedicated, faithful service in the federal government, and I'm stuck doing entry-level work that some kid could do right out of high school. Well, I believe in government. It's not how much uh, you spend, but how you spend it. Uh, we, we're spending a lot of money, and what's happened is predictable. Uh, first, we were going to have uh, 20,000 screeners, federal screeners. Then it turned into 40,000. Now it's 58,000, a small army. Actually, the rule of thumb is the more people you have involved uh, in trying to detect uh, weapons, uh, materials like explosives that could take down uh, an aircraft, the more people you have, the less efficient the operation. The higher the technology, you actually can use fewer people and you get better detection. But heaven forbid uh, TSA would replace uh, people with technology. Uh, Mr. Hawley, I, I know that we spent a bunch of money on checkpoint technology and uh, reconfiguration. And um, I know that we did spend a bunch of money on expl explosive trace portals. And GAO has reported that 114 of these explosive trace portals are sitting in storage at a cost of over 20 million. Um, if we didn't need them, why did we buy them? And if we need them, why are they sitting in storage? The, um, there are some maintenance issues with them in terms of, um, they're, they're called puffers because they put compressed air out and lint and other things go up into the filters and can clog them. And we're working with the industry to make them more reliable. And in other words, when you have a large portal in the The one area where they've made the least progress is in technology. Um, and since TSA's creation, they've researched and developed 10 technologies. Of those, none of them have uh, been deployed at airports nationwide. Some of them have initiated deployments, but nothing's been out there nationwide at all of the commercial airports. What TSA focuses on is the threat du jour. A TSA tester had a bag, they put clothing in, they put a bomb assembled in, they put clothing, they put a bottle of water on top. The bag goes through. The screener and the x-ray stop the bag. 
lift the bottle of water off, close the bag, return the bag to the TSA tester who then took the bag with the fully assembled bomb and went aboard plane. They focus on all kinds of minutia and crap rather than the items they need to. While confiscating water bottles and ignoring bombs, TSA sometimes aggressively investigates items that have nothing to do with aviation security. What do you do for a living? Uh, am I legally required to tell you that? Well, I'll tell you what. Do you want to play smart ass? And I'm not going to play your fucking game. I was coming back from a uh, Campaign for Liberty conference, which is my employer, in St. Louis, uh, late March. And as I was going through the, uh, the screener, the, the last uh, you know, set of uh, security, I had uh, in my laptop carry-on box a metal cash box that was carrying about $4,700 in uh, donations, uh, ticket sales, bumper sticker sales, t-shirts, things like that. The Stephen Beerfield incident was, that's a good example of the randomness at airports. He was pulled out of line because they saw a metal box in his bag. They wanted to look inside the metal box. They found money. Apparently, you can't travel with money anymore. You have to explain to the government why you had the money, which is what he was pulled into a small room and harassed to tell the government why he had money. This was a very unique situation for the news media because it wasn't just someone's word. We heard the entire conversation. Why do you have all this money? I asked her if I'm required by law to answer the question. I'm just asking you why you have 47 now. I understand you want, to, you want to talk to the EDA about it? As I was going from the uh, airport terminal into this small windowless room, I can see I'm being let into it. And my thought is, you know, this may be a bigger deal than it is so far. Um, I've already gone this far with this guy. I, I'm not going to give up my rights. I know what the Constitution says. I'm pretty, pretty firm on not bending on that. Let me make sure there's, you know, a non-bias witness and recording of the whole thing. So I was carrying an iPhone, and I just happened to take it out of my pocket, you know, click record on it, put it in my, my front jacket pocket, and walk into the room. And from that point on, it records the whole conversation. It's a simple, simple question. question. I just want to know why you have $47. That's not an unusual thing. I care if I need 50 bucks. He refused to ask any questions. He I knew what the Constitution said, and I was simply asking them, am I required by law to answer your questions? You know, please tell me what my rights are. Can you search me without, you know, without cause? Am I breaking a law? You will be. If you, you don't walk out this office. Yes, you'll be going to the station. You'll be forced. Okay, that's fine. That's, yeah, I understand. You're, you're going to be going to the station. Now, do we have to put you? So in? they take me out of the room, the police officers, and I get about another ten yards down the concourse, back towards the front of the airport, and a plainclothes officer, who I, I guess was some type of supervisor, calls them back and he says, "What are you guys doing?" And I go back in the room, and about a minute later, he says, "Oh, you know, these are campaign, you know, contributions and, and money for your organization." There were also checks that said to campaign for liberty, so it wasn't that difficult. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, and he said, oh, you're free to go. You're free to go. Okay. Thank you. I'm not saying that TSA does not have the right to search for legitimate reasons. In my case, what I did had nothing to do with airline security. I was literally carrying money. I was carrying cash, which is legal. Uh, I think it sets a very bad precedent when the TSA is more focused on that than they are on security. It's a, uh, a continual process to try to keep uh, TSA from overstepping their bounds. Yes, we want to detect uh, things that, that, would, uh, that would offer a threat. Uh, yes, uh, we want to stop people uh, who uh, would, would pose a threat. But uh, the system now treats uh, everybody sort of like a, a, a potential uh, terrorist, and that's not the way it should be. You're suspicious to me. The U.S. system currently relies on more than 60,000 security checkpoint screeners, known officially as Transportation Security Officers, or TSOs. Their title, uniforms, and badges imply they are law enforcement officers, but they are not. When you put someone in the uniform with a shield, there is an expectation by the public that that person can protect them and function as a police officer. Not someone you simply dress up in nice pants and a nice shirt and a shiny badge and say, let's play cop. Again, one of the problems we've had with TSA is uh, we've created the bureaucracy. It was uh, a bureaucracy 
based on screening. Now it's evolving into uh, enforcement. Uh, uh, you've seen the colorful, very expensive badges uh, to try to signal uh, that they're law enforcement to officers. That wasn't uh, in intended. As uh, with any bureaucracy, they try to extend their authority and you see the same thing going on with TSA. Despite the badge, TSA screeners are not empowered to make arrests, nor are they authorized to use force. That remains the responsibility of highly trained law enforcement professionals. Individuals like P. Jeffrey Black. On 9-11, I was active duty in the Air Force out on a flight line working on a military aircraft. Immediately after that, I saw the Federal Air Marshal job posted on the internet. And I just looked back on my qualifications from law enforcement to military police work, civilian police work, and then my experience as an aircraft maintenance technician. And I thought it was a, a perfect background for a Federal Air Marshal. And it was soon after that is when I was hired. Prior to every mission, the air marshals would go out and shoot. And they would shoot a firearms course called the TPC. It's a very difficult firearms course, and the air marshals are very proud of it. If you could not pass the TPC test, you didn't keep your job. Until the TSA took over. When that happened, these new managers that came in, they couldn't pass the TPC test. On occasion, they fly with us. They had to pass that TPC test. They couldn't do it. They just got rid of the test. It's very important to stay focused on the unique environment that the air marshals operate in. They're in what we call a close quarters environment. There isn't much room. There's very little margin of error there. You either will stop the threat or you don't stop the threat, and the consequences are severe if you fail. No other federal agency had such high firearm standards, and we were proud of that. And then one day, we're not gonna do it anymore. Now the program evolves where we need to desperately protect our airline industry. We're under a great time constraint. We don't want our airline industries to fold. We want the American public to be confident that they can fly and safely get from point A to point B. So you've got a quality group of federal law enforcement officers who are now making up what is the Air Marshal Service post 9-11. Since that time, uh, their attrition rate has been very high. And more immediately during that time period, there were issues with the executive management within the service. They were more focused on, on things like dress code than they were on real strategic practices that would best protect the public. Senior managers would actually call air marshals who were on board a plane for takeoff and ask them to deboard the plane to make sure they had their sports coat or dress coat. I talked to air marshals who hid in the lab and turned off their cell phone to hide from managers because they didn't meet the dress code. Uh, you know, whether they were flying to Hawaii or Vegas, they had to wear a coat and a tie, and, and they, they, they stood out like sore thumbs. The concern that the air marshals had is that if we stand out to other passengers, then we're going to stand out to the bad guys. Right when the policy was established, we went to our supervisors and said, this is making our job very difficult. How do you expect us to blend in with the passengers when we're wearing suits and ties. And of course, their reply was, we need to have you have a professional image on that plane. Well, the managers believed that in case of a hijacking, if we were not dressed in a full suit with military grooming standards, the passengers on the plane would not believe we were federal air marshals. We boarded the aircraft before the passengers. That was one of, one of the uh, flaws in the boarding procedures. And when the passengers saw us board ahead of time, they knew we were the air marshals. Uh, 
when they got on board the plane, they would shake our hand, they would pat us on the back and thank us for being on the plane. Well, if the passengers know who the air marshals are, so do the terrorists. It wasn't too long where air marshals were calling this new policy the kill me first dress code policy. You kill the guys with the suits first. When they're not compromising security with ill-conceived policy, TSA occasionally does it by accident. In March 2009, TSA posted their 93-page screening manual on the internet by mistake, revealing sensitive details on everything from equipment calibration to examples of CIA in diplomatic credentials. TSA management downplayed the significance of the breach, just as it had years earlier, when another embarrassing incident resulted in unwelcome public scrutiny. In July of 2003, we were all called into the field office and told that we had to have a security briefing, a one-on-one -on -one security briefing, where we had to come in, sit down with the security officer, and he was going to brief us on a threat. We had never had that been done before. The air marshals were informed of a threat involving international travel that included a stopover at an American airport to change planes. It warned that terrorists might use improvised weapons smuggled aboard aircraft in countries with lax security, then hijack planes as they transited through the United States. Protecting these flights in U.S. airspace required deploying air marshals on additional overnight assignments. Within a week of receiving this security briefing, we received a text message on our phone from Air Marshal Headquarters, unbelievably stating that all overnight flights were being canceled. I, mean, I thought it was a joke. We all did. I mean, that's our job. They all geared up. They were ready to respond and deal with the threat. Then they get a message sent to them in their internal system saying, you will stand down. We don't have the money to cover the expense it would take to house you or put you up in a hotel. You know, if you need the money to respond to a real threat, you go to Congress and ring the damn bell. But you respond to it. You always respond to the threat first. And if it costs an expense, if you're in the hole, I would think that our government would certainly fund a response to a meaningful threat whose impact could be quite severe. One air marshal decided he was going to leak the contents of the text message to the media. And within a couple days of us receiving that, that message, he did, in fact, leak that to the media. He interacts with a news affiliate. He discusses this. And, and by way of, of anecdotal uh, reaccounting of what transpired, rather than disputing what he said, they simply punish him and say, you revealed sensitive security information. You compromised our program. It's like, what did he compromise? You withdrew. You didn't respond to the threat. So what, in fact, did he compromise? What did he reveal? That you decided covering a hotel expense was more important than protecting uh, the lives of those flying? When the contents of the text message was leaked to the media, the management of the Air Marshal Service went completely ballistic. Hi, I'm Senator Boxer from California, a member of the Commerce Committee. I'm very proud Congress, on the other hand, they took Congress note of it, and the day after it was reported in the media, Senators Boxer, Clinton, and Schumer held a press conference condemning what TSA did. This agency has hired people to recruit baggage screeners. They sent them not just to Telluride, to a luxury spa, to the Waldorf Astoria, Wyndham Peaks and Telluride I mentioned, Mandalay Bay in, Lani, in, uh, in Hawaii, Hawks Cay Resort, the Florida Keys. This agency says, we can't afford to have sky marshals flying around protecting air travelers because we can't afford to have them and stay in hotels. Well, you know, when it dealt with recruiting, they stayed in the best hotels in the world. The day after these senators gave their press conference and their condemnation of what TSA did, somehow, out of the blue, $9 million appeared the very next day. And with that $9 million, the air marshals were allowed to do their overnights for the remainder of the fiscal year. Removing air marshals to save $9 million during a period of heightened alert 
seems a strange choice for an agency that spends billions annually and continually requests and receives generous budget increases every year. Our figures reflect that from fiscal year 2004 and there's no um, there's not really good accurate data before FY 2004 so we started 04 through FY09 um, is 33 billion um, has been spent by TSA on transportation security issues. The vast majority of that is devoted to aviation security and a very small percentage to surface transportation security. In the summer of 2004, the House Judiciary Committee began an inquiry into charges of corruption and misconduct within the TSA. Air Marshal Black testified before the committee in August. It took nearly two years to complete the report. When it was finally ready in 2006, the TSA requested a copy before it was made public. As a courtesy, the committee chairman, Wisconsin Republican Jim Sensenbrenner, agreed to the request. So once TSA got their hands on this report, they took a nice big black pen and blacked out most of uh, the important things in the report. Then they send it back to Representative Sensenbrenner and says, gee, thanks for letting us look at it, but uh, we put a nice big stamp of sensitive security information on the, on the front of it, and uh, you can't release it to the public now. What was that information? It was all information that, that was embarrassing to TSA. There are several classifications. The most used by TSA and Homeland Security is SSI, Sensitive Security Information, or Official Use Only. Some of the documents that my sources provided me, some memos that were stamped for official use only, were vacancy announcements that were posted on the internet, and one was a memo to employees to join them for Krispy Kreme donuts and coffee for a going away party. Not exactly a top government secret, but these are the kind of, of documents that TSA was randomly labeling SSI and for official use only, even though they denied that there was any randomness to it. They didn't comment on the Krispy Kreme donut memo. The SSI label has also been used to mute awareness of incidents far more serious than the occasional internal meeting for coffee and donuts. A gathering of a different sort occurred at 30,000 feet, well after 9-11 aboard Northwest Airlines Flight 327 from Detroit to Los Angeles on June 29, 2004. It was a very scary, surreal flight. I first heard about Flight 327 from angry pilots who were calling me and, and urging me to, to look into the matter. They even accused us of covering it up. And in particular, what the pilots were saying to me, they were saying, this is happening all the time. You need to look at this. I was 21C. I was I'm either one or two rows in front of the exit row. The plane takes off, and when the unfastened seatbelt sign comes on, it was all of a sudden there were all these men, Middle Eastern men, that got out of their seats, and they're walking up and down the aisle. When I saw these men stand up, they could have been blonde-haired, blue-eyed men, but it was standing up in unison and the walking up and down the aisles the way that they were doing it that really had me concerned. And the walking up and down the aisles wasn't just someone that walks up and down the aisle for exercise, but it was a, method it was a methodical walk, almost as if um, counting, counting the seats or counting the passengers. What caught my attention about the details of the flight were the repeated trips to the lab. The FBI had done a, a report earlier that year, there wasn't a whole lot of publicity about it, but I was aware of it, that they were warning airlines, particularly overseas, to stop people from congregating near the rear lab. They were going into the lab repeatedly, staying for long periods of time, and were blocking the lab door. And they sent out that bulletin because they were concerned that terrorists were going to try and sneak bomb parts onto a plane and assemble the bomb in the lab. An inquiry into Flight 327 by the Office of the Inspector General substantiated the claims made by passengers of disruptive activity by the 13 men, 12 of whom were Syrian nationals with expired visas. 
Their behavior was characteristic of a probe by terrorists to evaluate security measures while planning an attack. I first heard the terms probe and dry run after my initial story on 327 hit the newsstands. Air marshals started calling me and saying, you're on the right track. This is what we're seeing. This is what we think happened. There were, there were air marshals who, who thought it was a probe, and there were others who thought it was a dry run. The difference, a probe, is activity designed to get reaction, to maybe out an air marshal, to, to probe and see what you're going to do, what kind of security measures are taking place. A dry run, which uh, most air marshals think this was, would be in a, you know, a, a dress rehearsal, a dress rehearsal of a hijacking. I've been involved in at least three what I believe to be serious probes where I thought that there were Arab males on my flight that were testing the security on board that aircraft. I had airline captains telling me what was happening, you know, similar probes and dry runs on their flights. I was hearing it from flight attendants. There were reports filed. There was one incident that was uh, very serious. An air marshal actually broke down the door of a la the front lab because a passenger had been in there way too long and discovered that he had actually removed the mirror from the wall. There was about a half dozen probes that I reported initially with 327. Congress said, hey, we got a report from these air marshals that these probes are happening. We want to know about them. And Director Quinn sends a letter back and says, nothing's happening on our watch. Well, what Quinn didn't know was these air marshals have already submitted their mission reports to the House Judiciary Committee. And then the House Judiciary Committee comes back, sends a letter back to Quinn going, hey, we know you're lying. We're going to give you a second chance. Next thing you know, they're backing a truck up to the Capitol and they're pulling out hundreds of these mission reports and giving them to the House Judiciary Committee. They lied. They got caught. Evidence of TSA's habit of suppressing information re-emerged when Air Marshal Black attended a course at the agency's training center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. At that time, I asked the director of the training there if he was training Air Marshals on what happened on my flight with the probe. And he indicated to me he didn't know what I was talking about. And I, I explained it to him, and he said, we know nothing about it. And then I explained the two other incidences that I had. He didn't know about them either. The director of the Air Marshal Service was not distributing these reports to other law enforcement agencies or even to other air marshals. Well, the question is, why would the manager sit on this information? Isn't that exactly what happened prior to 9-11 with the FBI? Their FBI agents were sending information up the chain of command and it wasn't getting to headquarters? Isn't that exactly was one of the causes of 9-11? And here we are, after 9-11, doing the exact same thing? We propose in the Pan Am 103 Commission, the establishment of an assistant secretary of transportation for aviation security and a small unit within the government whose job would be to gather intelligence from foreign and domestic sources, evaluate that information and disseminate it and do this without regard to bureaucracy status. It was never done. On Christmas Day, 2009, a Nigerian man attempted to blow up Northwest Airlines Flight 253 from Amsterdam to Detroit with bomb components hidden in his underwear. He was thwarted not by the multi-billion dollar TSA with eight years of operational experience, but by a courageous passenger. Most significantly, U.S. agencies had ample information to revoke the Nigerian's visa and put his name on the no-fly list. The man's own father had alerted authorities to his son's terrorist connections. The incident revealed persistent problems that continued to create vulnerabilities in the aviation system. Failure to share information, failure to turn raw data into actionable intelligence, and a one-size-fits-all approach to screening in which every passenger is treated like a criminal.
There's a place where American aircraft are dumped when they're removed from service. It's called the Boneyard. It filled up quickly after 9-11, when 19 hijackers crippled the airline system and traumatized the world. Many of those aircraft sit here today, silent monuments to the brutal calculus of terror. By sowing fear, jihadists wield power out of all proportion to their numbers. They threaten not just lives, but a way of life, fostering a paranoid mindset in which innocent travelers accept being harassed and stripped naked in a pointless search for absolute safety. They have also created vast opportunities for companies peddling expensive technology of questionable value. But massive expenditures and grossly expanded government authority have failed to produce an aviation security system that is rational, effective, and proportionate to the risk. Until such a system is developed, airline passengers around the world will sacrifice their time, dignity, and freedom of movement for nothing more than an elaborate facade of security. Uh, the reports I get is the performance actually has been going down. The larger the workforce, the actual performance in detection, uh, which is monitored by uh, both the general accounting, uh, TSA itself, and then the IG of Homeland Security. But those reports are classified. You wouldn't want to see them because they're quite frightening. Uh, and, and actually, of late, they've, uh, with more personnel and more technology, they've even performed poorer. What we've got now is nothing but security theater, meaning all of these bells and whistles that you see is only meant to make you feel safe. The TSA was invited to participate in this film, but declined to be interviewed. TSA claims that governments around the world are watching and learning from the United States. If so, they'd be well advised to follow TSA's example of avoiding critical scrutiny. Because the truth is that on TSA's watch, airport security has become a jobs program for bureaucrats, a gold mine for technology vendors, and for the air traveler and the airlines, an expensive, humiliating, and counterproductive fraud. Have your boarding oh, passes yeah, ready. Let's make sure they're less the belt. than three All ounces. laptops out and into a bin All with nothing on top of them. All carry-on items go on the belt. All metal out of your pockets, cell phones, jewelry, eyeglasses, All glasses, metal into the objects bin. must be out of your pockets. That's cell phones, keys, jewelry, glasses. Please remove your shoes and put them If you're carrying any liquids, make sure that they are less than three ounces. Otherwise, you go back to check-in and place them in your checked baggage. Please place your shoes and overcoats on the belt. On items onto the Bags, belt. purses, bundles onto the belt.